This is finally Bob. it, Dr. Tony. <laughs> Yeah, hi, hi Elizabeth. Sorry, I didn't say, I didn't say hello to you either. <clears throat> I can hear everybody. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yes. Good. I think there's a little bit of a lag between the way my mouth moves and the way the words and the way the sounds come out. <laughs> probably no one will notice any difference though, because I'm probably there's probably always something wrong with the way I speak anyway. Now, now. <laughs> I like your I like your uh, your your screen back there, Paul. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's home right there. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Eastern Tennessee. That's right. All right. You gotta keep us reminded of such things. <laughs> I'm gonna be just west of there in Missouri. Yeah. Right at uh, Kirksville, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Dr. Donato, looking beautiful as always. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just trying to move in a place where there's less glare. So yeah, I but I wanted to be in a I'm in a room where there's a lot of sunlight. So to 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 feel light, the light of your of your research here. Fantastic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful day here today. Well, Los Angeles, it always is. Yeah, <laughs> I miss I miss home, San Diego. You're so yeah, cool. it is, it's been uh, the the last uh, few days have just been gorgeous weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is home for you. I know. I love reading all this stuff about about LA uh, Spanish. Oh, yeah. I haven't been in San Diego in so long. Oh my yeah. goodness. So, and I think some of my LA family is online. Great. So I'm, I'm the first, as far as I know, I'm the first one to get this far in the entire family, so. That's very exciting. Well, yeah. it was like that for me too. So it's a big day. Ah, exciting. They're actually in Long Beach. Um, oh, really? In Carson, in Carson and in Long Beach. Oh, wow. Yay. Pretty close Great. to Great. Well, I'm on sabbatical, so I'm home in Redondo Beach. I live in Redondo. Oh, nice. Yeah. nice. Very nice. I'll get out there one of these days after I'm nice and settled in Missouri. Yeah, well, you, well you come over for dinner. <laughs> I would love to. I would absolutely love to. All right, all right. I'll just talk about the beach. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my heart's beating. <laughs> what is that? What is that behind you on the map? Is that a map? That is. So, so that is um, that is the uh, designation of all of these counties are Appalachia. So oh, from wow. from Mississippi to New York, and my home is right there. So that's where I'm from, and this is where we are. So okay. we are still within the Great mm -hmm. Appalachian region. Great. I love that map. Yeah, I'm, uh, this is actually a, an image I, had, I made for my dissertation. So back then oh, I was just, I was, I, was chan I was just channeling the, oh, just sort of the, yeah, the, 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 the grad school vibe. So <laughs> yep. oh, that's great. <laughs> awesome. Thank that's you really all good. for being here. Thank you so much. Especially those of you guys that are on sabbatical, like Dr. Kronkowicz, kind of seen you in forever. Good to see oh, you. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just posted something in the chat screen. Can everybody see it? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that way, if somebody comes in late and they pull up the chat, the chat uh, stream, they will be able to see those instructions. So Aaron, how many people uh, are we going to, we're not going to see any of the other people, are we at all? Um, besides our, our little panel? The technology doesn't, uh, isn't, uh, doesn't show that. Okay. Um, I can tell you, we um, probably can wait a few more minutes. Um, sure. From what I yeah. see, but w welcome, of course, to everyone. Yeah. We've got 22 outside of us here already. 
Okay. Okay. Where are you? See. Where are you seeing that, Paul? If you click participants oh, down at the bottom, it'll mm -hmm. pull up. Uh, it has then it has two tabs: one for panelists and then one for attendees. Oh yeah, yeah. I mm -hmm. see. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I put up. Uh, yeah, I see that. Thank you. I'm still learning the ins and outs of all of this. Oh. I think I know by now. But... Mike, let me go ahead and um, see if I can make you co-host um, while we're doing this. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, I see family and friends logged on. Oh, I see Jill Pacconi's here. Oh, if it weren't for Jill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jill. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is amazing. Oh. My little brother Jimmy is deployed and he is in Korea. He just left a message. Hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you, Jimmy. Wow. For being... So great. He's here. <laughs> it's 5 30 in the morning in Korea. So oh, and he got up. Well, he's he's in the he's in the army, so he's he's had to be up anyway. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think he has to be uh, I think he has some kind of <laughs> in like a few minutes. So I'm like, well, if you can catch a little bit, I'd appreciate it. So. Oh, just for him to tie in is so great. Yes, yes, I appreciate that. So I think it's time. Okay, so it's, it's 3.30. Um, I guess I can start and because uh, it'll take a little while to get to Elizabeth anyhow. So should I go ahead and start? Let's do this. All right, let's do it. So uh, there's what about 30 plus 40 of us now gathered together already. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm, I extend a, a warm welcome to everyone to uh, this first part of the dissertation defense of Elizabeth Naranjo Hayes. This is the part that will be public, uh, which will be followed by a private part where the committee uh, whose members you see, you should see are going to be having a question answer session with Elizabeth and then we'll evaluate her, her, her uh, dissertation and come to a decision. That part though is reserved for, it's not, it's not really open to the general public, uh, but we're very happy to have everybody included in this first part for the presentation that Elizabeth will be giving. So let me begin by introducing myself and after that, uh, the other members of the committee will be introducing themselves. We'll just go in alphabetical order. So after I'm done with my introduction, it'll be Clorinda, and then um, Brian, and then Aaron, and then Paul. And then I'll just have a few more comments to make to give a little bit of, of uh, the, the focus is gonna be completely on, on Elizabeth here and her research, but I do wanna just give a little bit of contextual background uh, to help, help explain um, some things about this topic in general and what attracted Elizabeth to it and how we all came together uh, for this, the purposes of helping her achieve her, her academic goals uh, in exploring this topic. Um, so let me then, uh, and then after that, um, uh, I will introduce Elizabeth um, and then she uh, will, um, present her dissertation research her her uh, her uh, her um, with a powerpoint hopefully it will be visible to everybody um, we, um also then point out what a something that i've already posted to the chat stream just for latecomers and that is that during this public part we can't really uh have questions from everyone it'd be great if everybody had opportunity to have verbal exchanges but that just would take too long and we need to go to the second part, which is private, which is just the committee interacting with Elizabeth. But we're very, very interested in having everyone's input if we possibly can. And so if you have questions or comments that you wanna make, please, by all means, post them using the chat option. Uh, we're gonna say that 
so we'll have all those comments, but the one with the saving option for some reason does not include your email address. It does include your name typically, but now it's your email address. So please think to include your email address with your comments or questions if you'd like Elizabeth to get back to you uh, to interact further on this topic, okay? So let me quickly introduce myself and then there'll be the other panelists and then we'll proceed. So my name is Michael Picconi. Uh, I've taught here at the University of Alabama, well, uh, specializing in, in linguistics and French for 32 years. I just recently retired in 2020, uh, but I have retained emeritus status and uh, I'm still helping out with a few graduate students and one of them, of course, prominently being Elizabeth. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, we have some, uh, her, her interest, matches with something I've already done research on, so it does make sense. However, she was very smart. She made friends with my wife. And so when, when, when Jill heard that Elizabeth had asked me to go ahead and direct her dissertation, even though I'd be retiring, uh, she, my, uh, my wife, Jill said, of course you must do that. <laughs> so that made it, every other consideration a moot point from that, from that, from that point on. All right. <laughs> Um, my, my own research then has started out on lexical creativity and borrowings in the French of France while writing my doctorate at the Sorbonne uh, in Paris. Uh, once I was hired at the University of Alabama back in, in uh, 1988, uh, I began work on historical and contemporary profiles of a closer French, which is the French and Creole also in Louisiana. And then that led to even a greater kind of uh, exploration of language and dialect in contact throughout the Gulf South. So that's kind of my general uh, introduction about myself. And so I'd now like to go to the other members of the committee. So let's begin with Clorinda. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Clorinda Donato. I am a professor of French and Italian at California State University, Long Beach. I also direct a um, donor-funded Center on Global Romance Languages and Translation Studies. I'm actually an 18th century expert, but um, when I was noticing that 80 and 90% of my students were Spanish speakers, I became very interested in multilingualism and in teaching them um, through Italian and French through Spanish and not English. And so I've developed the, a second um, area of specialization, even though I am not a trained linguist, I am somewhat uh, self-trained and I um, have developed uh, teaching materials on French and Italian for Spanish speakers. I have uh, worked uh, on um, uh, the um, uh, code switching in, in um, reggaeton. Uh, I gave a, um, a uh, paper, a, um, uh, a plenary uh, talk at Auburn and met Elizabeth. And um, we spent a long time talking about her research and it's an absolute privilege and pleasure to be on this dissertation committee. So thank you all. Okay, and then next one alphabetically would be Brian. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Brian Cronkowitz. I'm an associate professor of Spanish linguistics here at the University of Alabama. Um, and yeah, I do research on bilingualism broadly defined, but my particular area that I do most uh, is Spanish English code switching, but from a syntactic perspective. So looking at the structural sort of composition when we mix the two languages together. Okay, thank you. Paul? No, I'm sorry, Aaron next. Aaron, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Erin O'Rourke. Um, I am an associate professor at uh, the University of Alabama in Spanish, and I work on Spanish sociophonetics and um, specifically um, an area of um, interest and in research is intonation and indigenous languages in contact with Spanish. And Paul. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Paul Reed. I am a assistant professor uh, in the Department of Communicative Disorders. Uh, my background is in sociophonetics, and I look at regional and place-based variation in uh, the English varieties of the American South. Uh, and I um, look at various things from a vocalic and intonational phenomena. Um, I've also done some work on syntactic uh, phenomena in the Amer in varieties of the American South. Great. Now, um, I want to point out that every single member of this committee has gone above and beyond the call of duty in some way or the other. Uh, Clorinda is actually. And so is Brian. Uh, and so they have nevertheless uh, been, uh, been uh, very, very kind with their time and energy to participate in this uh, dissertation uh, committee. Uh, Paul has got fantastic knowledge in, in terms of uh, statistical measures uh, mm -hmm. in, for, for looking at linguistic topics. And he has brought that to bear to be a big help. Mm -hmm. Erin does that too. Mm -hmm. uh, but what she also is really good at is uh, she's, she's, uh, been our, she's managed all of this online for us, this, uh, this dissertation defense. Mm -hmm. And it became a kind of a complex thing. Uh, and that goes back to one of the qualities of, of uh, Elizabeth, her enthusiasm and kind of unrestrained way sometimes she goes about doing things that I will get back to. But I want to give uh, all of these people a really big thank you, all the members of the committee, uh, for going above and beyond the call of duty in order to uh, allow this to happen and to help Elizabeth reach her goals. So um, let me just say then a couple more contextual remarks, and then I'll introduce Elizabeth, and then she'll be off and running. So uh, in the course of my investigations of Louisiana French and Creole, I couldn't help but notice how Cajun and Zydeco musicians in both the recordings and in live performances were often switching between verses in French or Creole and English. Mm -hmm. So this is what first piqued my interest in the phenomenon of what I came to call artistic code mixing, uh, which, uh, which can be a wide phenomena. There has been a lot of research done on it already in areas like, um, uh, like literature and theater, but practically nothing until I started look, doing research and a few others on it in the realm of lyrical code switching, which has now become a huge phenomenon. So uh, I began looking at this topic more closely, not, not only with regard to Cajun and Zydeco music, but other, uh, other um, realms of uh, uh, musical genre. And uh, so I actually had turned out one of the earliest publications as far, as far as I know on this topic, it's called Art Artistic Code Mixing. It came out in 2002. Mm -hmm. It's easy to find if you're interested and you wanna download it. It's very easy, just, uh, just Google, Google Artistic Code Mixing, add my name. It should take you to Scholarly Commons site it's run by the University of Pennsylvania and you're, you can download a copy for free. Um, and I also gave uh, seminars at, uh, on this topic, uh, on, excuse me, language, it's languages in, in contact in general while I was teaching at the University of Alabama. And the topic I noticed that was the most uh, what, uh, engaging for the, my students was the topic of lyrical code switching. So that's where uh, kind of there's some originality to what uh, I did and a few other researchers, uh, early researchers, and it's, it's a growing field. A couple, just to, let, to name them, because the, uh, I would like to, a couple of the early researchers on this topic are Abdelali uh, Bentahili and Aris Davies at uh, Abdel Malik Esai University in Morocco. They also published something in 2002 on this topic uh, in, with regard to North African rye music, which is also very, very popular in France. It's, uh, it's really uh, very energetic music. Um, also, Mela Sarkar and Lise Weiner and sometimes Kobe Sarkar formed a team that started publishing things in 2005 on this topic with regard to rap and hip hop in Quebec. Mm -hmm. They're at the McGill University in Montreal. And then uh, one of the very first, maybe the very first, I'm not sure, but at least one of the very first uh, di doctoral dissertations on this topic was done by someone who uh, contacted me and ended up becoming a member of her committee her dissertation committee, that's Linda Flores Olsen. She's mm -hmm. Swedish and she did her dissertation at the University of Gothenburg, Jutebori in Swedish. Um, and uh, she's now teaching there. So it was a privilege to serve on that committee and now we're doing it again, this time with Elizabeth. 
So even though this, this is uh, now a couple of decades that this has been going on, it's still really in its infancy and it's taking off like crazy. Um, so this is kind of the thing that's fascinated Elizabeth. And actually, as far as I know, she had this, this was already on her mind before she ever even came to the University of Alabama or knew anything about me or anybody else. She's already interested in this topic. Um, so it was a fortuitous uh, event when she came here and we were able to connect. Um, but um, <clears throat> I want to then um, uh, say, oh, uh, so let me also intersect at this point though, that in addition to the lyrical code mixing that she's gonna be looking at, we did want it to, we wanted, we got together as a committee and different individuals. We wanted her to also to round out her background and be able to deal with kind of the more the traditional nuts and bolts of linguistic analysis. So that's how we arrived at uh, another a parallel uh, field uh, to go along with that, which is uh, the uh, sociophonetics and the coda, the, the, um, the manifestation of syllable final S, coda S. Mm -hmm. In, in, in Spanish, uh, in, in this performance, in the uh, spontaneous speech and the artistic performance speech and singing of various artists that she's looking at. Uh, and that's highly variable it's in Spanish, this, uh, the amount of state, the, uh, the phonetics of, of that uh, particular feature. And so this was an excellent way to go in that direction and kind of see what we what kind of results that she would come up with. I think she has come up with some impressive results for both areas, both the sociophonetically and also the lyrical code mixing. Um, so let me introduce Elizabeth and then it'll be and then she'll be off on her she'll be on her own for the remainder until I just close very briefly at the end. So Elizabeth and Ron Hohes is a candidate here at the University of Alabama in the PhD program in Romance Languages specializing in linguistics, combining that with both Spanish and French. She earned her prior MA in Spanish linguistics at San Diego State University, and also a prior BA at that same institution in majoring in Spanish and French. She is a veteran of the US Army, so we wanna thank her uh, for her service to the country, to all of us. She's a Spanish English bilingual, born and raised in the United States, but in an ethnically Mexican house, raised in an ethnically Mexican household, if I can put it that way, I hope that's all right. Um, she has plenty of teaching experience already. She, of course, is a GTA here at the University of Alabama, uh, teaching both Spanish and French. She did, uh, she was also a, a graduate instructor prior to this at, at San Diego State. Mm -hmm. And she's taught at other venues, Georgia Military College, Central mm -hmm. Te Texas College at the Fort Benning campus, Columbus State University in Georgia, and San Diego Community College. Mm -hmm. She also has plenty of experience in interpreting and translating. Mm -hmm. But in order to go to the next level, she needs her doctoral degree. And so that's why we are here. And that's why she came to the University of Alabama to, to obtain that. And when she does, we're, uh, pending, pending success at uh, the defense and uh, final revision and submission of her dissertation to the, the graduate school at the University of Alabama, uh, she will then, then have awaiting her a wonderful tenure track position that has been offered her already at Truman State University located in Kirksville, Missouri. So let me just say to finish up my introduction that has truly been uh, a a privilege, an immense privilege to work with her. She's very intelligent, hardworking, creative, enthusiastic, someone I admire very much. And an example of her enthusiasm is that she just immediately ran with the whole, op a whole opportunity that opened up when we decided to do all of this on Zoom. And we did, why do we do it on Zoom? Well, for one thing, Clorinda is in California. Another thing, Clarinda and Brian are on sabbaticals. We don't necessarily want them to have to come back to campus mm -hmm. for that. Um, and then who knows, at the time that we all set this all up, we didn't know if uh, COVID would be surging or not. So we thought, we'll just do it all online, which is great, but we weren't thinking like Elizabeth thinks. <laughs> so she immediately uh, thought about, oh, I'm gonna invite a lot of people to this. Uh, and which is why so many of you have signed up, I guess, at la latest count, we're now at 46 altogether. <laughs> that is ne absolutely not typical for a dissertation defense, right? 
So then we had to adjust. And this is where Erin did so much work for us and, owes, and everyone owes her a great debt. So she uh, figured out that if we could set up the, um, this part as a webinar, we could accommodate this crowd that's interested in this topic and wants to see Elizabeth's presentation. And then when we're done with this, we'll close this and the, and the committee who you see uh, on the screens in front of you and Elizabeth will then go to another, a different link to another session where we will have our question and answer period uh, privately with just a few select individuals who are gonna be there because they have a vested interest. Um, and then we will, uh, uh, and then we will conclude the, uh, the defense. So that's what's happening. So uh, just a uh, remind, reminder, if you wanna pose a, a comment, make a comment or, a quest, or pose a question, do so on chat and don't forget to include your email address if you want Elizabeth to get back to you later. I think I'm done. Elizabeth, it's all yours. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So off I go. Let me see. Hold on, let me get my screen shared. Oh, hold on. I don't see it. Let me see. Can you guys see the screen? Nope. Mm -mm, not yet. Let me see. Mm -mm. Can you? Nope. I can't see uh, looks it. like some, something's coming up. No. Not yet. No. Oh, I see it now. Hold on. Okay. Let me see. There it is. Okay. So let me. Okay. Now, can you guys see the, the blank screen? Okay. Awesome. Yes. All right. Well, first of all, yes. so here is. Okay. So you guys can see this. Can you guys see the, the title screen? Okay. Perfect. Yes. All right, so first of all, I want to thank each and every person who took the time to be here today to share this momentous day with me. A huge thank you to my amazingly incredible committee of subject matter experts, especially Dr. Paconi, without whom I never would have chosen the University of Alabama for my PhD. Um, my name again is Elizabeth Naranjo Hayes. I am a San Diegan. I am the mother of three. Uh, I am a child of Mexican immigrants. I am a first generation college student and a disabled army veteran. So today is truly a dream come true. Uh, here's the title of my presentation. I'm sure everybody who's here has seen it. And this is Bad Bunny and this is Jay Baldwin in case you guys don't know who they are. Uh, so here is the agenda for today. Just the basic parts of an academic presentation. Here are my guys, you can see them there. All right, so introduction. So after many generations in the present day US, us Latinx are finally reasserting our identity as part of the global Spanish speaking community. And it's going mainstream as many of you guys may have seen at the 2020 Super Bowl halftime show with these two gorgeous Latinas, uh, Shakira and Jennifer Lopez, plus their guests, Bad Bunny and Jay Balvin who were there. Um, there is an undeniable boom of hot Latin music, which is the name of the Billboard um, magazine chart. Um, and this boom is in the US and globally. And we can see this on Spotify. We can see this on YouTube. Um, and two ways in which I have seen Latinx identity reflected is in the coda S pronunciation, which is the end of syllable pronunciation of the top artists, and in their Spanish English code mixing practices. So rationale. So what led me to this topic? So I have always loved Latin and Francophone music. I've taught with top music in both my French and Spanish classes for years now. And obviously I'm a sociolinguist, uh, but something that caught my attention was the difference in pronunciation of the artist when singing versus when I heard them speak in interviews. I was also intrigued by the way I heard artists mixing languages in their songs and in their interviews. So these are the things that led to my code S in code mixing research. According to the COO of the Recording Industry Association of America, Latin music is absolutely booming and people across languages are connecting with it. And they did confirm that Bad Bunny was the most streamed artist in the world in 2021. 
But despite that, my study is the first to systematically use top Latin music for sociophonetic analysis. And it's also the first to focus on a comparison of artistic performance speech, which is my term, well, me and Dr. Pagani, <laughs> our term, and the spontaneous speech of top Latin artists. And motivations for any difference in the two have not been considered, nor any possible implications on the wider global audience, nor the American audience. So I chose Bad Bunny and J Balvin because they are two of the most prominent Latinx voices with the biggest platforms. So love them or hate them, they have the most potential to impact the speech of their wider audience. Also, their linguistic practices may illustrate a few complex dynamics. Number one, the use of sociophonetic features that are indexical of, which means they, they point at the, a larger Spanish speaking world. And two, code mixing that acknowledges the preeminence and ubiquity of US influence in pop music. So literature review very quickly. So these are just some of the studies that have done, that have been done, that have been written on this topic. Um, so starting with the sociophonetics of popular music, as you can see by the pictures, a lot of what's been studying has been on British pop music, uh, starting with Trudgell in 1983. So he looked at linguistic behavior, such as sounds that are typically different in British and American English, and in the music of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Now Simpson in 99, he did a comparable study to that of Trudgell, and he analyzed five variables of what he called Americanisms that he labeled the USA Five model, and as they were used by pop artists in the 90s. Gibson in 2015, he determined that pronunciation and accent choice in popular music in England was based on aesthetics, sonority and indexicality, again, pointing at something, um, and on the potential aesthetic that the singer is attempting to achieve. Gibson 2019, a whole different Gibson, no relation. He compared pop and hip hop music in New Zealand to determine if there's a standard popular music singing style, SPMSS, that's based on US English. And Caliol and Ferragna in 2019, they compared T voicing as an index of Americanization in Iron Maiden and Def Leppard songs and interviews. But the sociophonetics of popular Spanish language music, that is a novel topic that has yet to be researched. So now let's talk about language performance of identity. So Alam in 2002, he studied rappers Eve and Juvenile, remember them? Um, and their rates of copula absence. So copula absence is, for example, if a sentence is missing the verbs is or are. Um, and he deduced that, quote, juvenile is clearly more integrated into street culture than Eve, since he uses a higher rate of copula absence in both his speech and his performances. Now, Eberhard and Vidavia Marco in 2020, they determined that Beyonce used the covert prestige of African-American English to quote, display blackness in, in white public space and to quote, move from a female pop star to a black feminist icon. And Moody and Castellar, both in 2020, they noted that Afro-Latina rapper Cardi B, she does not switch codes, in this case, dialects or registers, despite the setting, and that she uses Spanish-accented African-American English due to her Spanish-speaking Dominican father and her Trinidadian mother. Uh, so indexicality. Uh, closely linked to language and identity is the concept of indexicality. I've mentioned that word before. So Dr. Paul Reed, who we just met, uh, who is on my dissertation committee, he stated in 2020 that, quote, often a way of speaking is associated or recognized as being indicative of where someone's from. That is, it indexes or points out place. An example from biblical times is the shibboleth. So as illustrated in this image, the warring Gileadites were controlling passage across the Jordan River, and they devised a linguistic identity test based on their pronunciation of the Hebrew word shibboleth. The identity of the rival Ephraimites was revealed by their pronunciation of the test word as sibboleth. They couldn't say it, and they were put to death. So that's what that word means. Um, and Rosa in 2010, he said that entire languages can actually be indexical, such as Spanish in the US can be indexical of US pan Latinx ethnicity, or pronunciations can be indexical of being from a specific region, like the example I showed here. Um, now, regarding language attitudes, 
La Real Academia, this is the ruling body over the Spanish language. They have taken issue with the language used in reggaeton. Uh, an example I have here comes from the former reggaeton power couple, Anuela A and Carol G, when he called her bebecita, like baby girl. Um, there were angry tweets all over the place from La Real Academia, despite all of the merchandising. <laughs> uh, touching on the covert prestige of stigmatized variants, uh, the Los Angeles born Becky G, she's been called out on social media, here she is, um, for singing using iconic features of black Caribbean Spanish, though she is of 100% Mexican ancestry. She has responded that it's not intentional, but the controversy continues. Um, so my research questions. These are the questions that are driving my study. So let's look at question one. This is the official question. Um, what it's basically asking is, do the two artists sing the way they speak regarding the variable realization of S in syllable final position? There's different ways that S can be pronounced. Um, and are they using it the same way? Question 1A, um, are they singing the way they speak or are they shifting to a different pronunciation? Question 1B, is the difference statistically significant? Question 1C, what motivations might cause a difference in the pronunciation when they sing versus when they speak? And then let's look at question number two. So here is the official wording of the question. What it's basically asking is, do the two, do the two artists sing the way they speak with regard to Spanish English code mixing practices? 2A, is the difference statistically significant? 2B, what motivations might cause a difference in their code mixing practices when they sing versus when they speak? And finally, question three. Here's the official question. And what it's basically asking is, is the lyrical code mixing, lyrical meaning just having to do with the songs, is the lyrical code mixing of the two artists identifiably similar or different than that of other top Spanish, English, and French artists who also lyrically code mix? And 3A, what, made, what motivations might explain this? So let's look at the methodology. And all that means is how the study was set up. As far as the design, this study includes both quantitative and qualitative research methods. And that really helped me to zero in on the findings from all sides. So the participants, uh, starting with Bad Buddy. So in addition to all of this stuff, two time Grammy winning, four Latin Grammys, I mean, on and on and on. In addition to all of this, um, he was also, he's also been Spotify's number one artist on the planet. Uh, for two years in a row, 2020 and 2021, recording industry of Asso uh, Association of America's number one artist for 2021. He's uh, number one on Bloomberg's pop star rankings for 2022 for most ticket sales. He has the highest grossing tour of all time by a Latinx artist. His album, El Ultimo Tour del Mundo, in 2020 became the first all Spanish language album to reach number one on Billboard. It just goes on and on. I mean, just ridiculous, amazing. Um, and let's look at um, Jay Balvin. So in addition to all this stuff, um, also he was one of Time's uh, 100 most influential people of 2020. And uh, he's also uh, one of Billboard's greatest Latin artists of all time. He got a Guinness World Record for the most Latin Grammy nominations in a single year because he got 13 in 2020. He had most viewed artists on YouTube in 2019, most popular artists on Spotify 2018. And it just, again, on and on, incredible. Um, so data collection and corpora. Uh, the data for this study was collected online via youtube.com, I do have premium. Um, as all the videos were readily accessible for global consumption, the songs, the songs that I used to create the corpus of artistic performance speech are songs that peaked in the top 10 on the Hot Latin Songs chart, and they also charted on the Hot 100 chart, which is typically English song, English language songs, and these were just from the, from the years 2018 to 2020. For the interviews, the ones that were chosen were the most viewed unscripted informal conversations in Spanish of at least five minutes duration uh, by each artist. And all the videos, the entire corpora, it's all available in its entirety on my website. It's on the homepage at elizabeth.people.ua.edu. So if you want to check them out, they are available there. Uh, so let's look at the songs. 
So for the, the collaborations I had, I like it uh, with Bad Bunny J Balvin and Cardi B. No me conoce, but J Cortez, la canción que pretendes, un día, one day with Dua Lipa and Tiny. For Bad Bunny, we had Te Bote with Casper Magico, Nio Garcia, Darel, Nikki J, Manosuna. Mia featuring Drake, awesome song. Bete, Callaita, Si Bebo Tu Mama, Dakiti featuring Jay Cortez. And for Jay Bovin, we had X with Nikki Jam, China with Anuela A, Daddy Yankee, Carol G, and Osuna. Baila 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 with Osuna. Ritmo uh, with Black Eyed Peas, Loco Contigo with DJ Snake and Taiga. En relación with Sech, Daddy Yankee, Rosalia, and Farruko. For the corpus of spontaneous speech, um, for both of them, they both sat down and talked to Complex Cover. They talked to um, El Guru. For Bad Bunny, we had an interview when he went to Don Francisco Te Invita. Um, this was a YouTube music artist spotlight story. And we have Bad Bunny go sneaker shopping with Complex, super cute. And for Jay Balvin, we have him playing Fortnite with the Gref, who is from Spain. Uh, we have him being interviewed on Rapeton by uh, El Grano con el Guru. And this is an Instagram Live that was recorded when he's talking to Ursula Corbero, who is the actress from La Casa de Papel, also um, called uh, Money Heist. If you haven't seen that on Netflix, that's awesome. Um, that's from Spain. So there was also a supplemental corpus of APS that had significant Spanish, English, and French code mixing. And the songs in the second half, which include French, primarily charted outside of the US. So let's look at these songs. So this top list was primarily Spanish, English lyrical code mixing. So we had Taki Taki with DJ Snake featuring Selena Gomez, Osuna, and Cardi B. We had um, Mamacita, Black Eyed Peas with Osuna and uh, Jay Rezol. We had Tusa with Carol G. Nicki Minaj. We had Calma with Pedro Capo, Alicia Keys, and Farruko. Con Calma with Daddy Yankee, Katy Perry, and Snow. And Hawaii with Maluma and The Weeknd. Uh, and then the bottom list was primarily Spanish French, but also had English lyrical code mixing. We had Pirate with uh, Maître Gims and J Balvin. We had My Salsa with Franklish and Tony Lanes. Or La Señorita with Gims and Maluma. Jaja by uh, Aya Nakamura and Maluma, Corazon with Gims, Low Wayne and French Montana, and Maria Maria by Kenji Girac. So methodology, what did I actually do with each of these? So um, to, explain, to explain question one, I'm gonna briefly explain what the different S variants are, and I'm gonna explain it using the word estas, because that word has two S's in coda position, which means two S's at the end of the syllable. So I was looking for one of the variants could be maintenance. Uh, for example, estas, you can hear the sibilant at the end of each syllable. Um, another option could be aspiration. That would be eh, ta. So that's, you only hear the friction, eh, ta. Another option um, is what I call unmarked deletion. So this would be eh, ta. So there is, there's no space, it's just altogether eh, ta. And what I call mark deletion. So there's a trace mark and there's a pause where the S, um, the S would have been. So it's eh, ta. Um, there were other two that I had coded for, but there were minimal tokens. So, you know, it didn't even have anything for that, for the glottal stop and the onset S. So using Pratt, um, each source word was identified, and Pratt's a, so a linguistic software. Um, each source word was identified and annotated. And then within the word, I also drilled down and found the S. And then it took nine measurements, but only for the S tokens and coded position. Um, I also did... I also did uh, find, I coded for these other 14 independent variables. I did code for all S tokens, but I ended up just using the code of S tokens just for the sake of time and because my, my study was just getting way too big. <laughs> so, um, so let's look at question two. Um, so these are the different categories of, uh, of code mix classes with examples of each. So um, if there was a single word switch, so an example of that would be Esos guys. A uh, single word borrowing, an example would be esos manes. Notice how man kind of had a little thing stuck to it. It was modified. Um, and then a calc, an example that would be están jugando safe. So they're playing it safe. There could be a tag switch or you're speaking Spanish, speaking Spanish, and you throw in, you know, so that's a tag switch. 
Um, there could be interest and tension code switching. For example, pues vino, then he left, all in one sentence. You kind of switch partway through in the sentence. There could be intersentential switching, uh, code switching when you say pues vino, period, then he left. So you end one sentence and then switch for the next sentence. Um, and then there's code intermediate. And this is something that was coined by Dr. Piconi. Um, so an example here would be j'ai deux truck. I have two trucks. This is a whole, a whole phenomenon that he, um, that he has written about. And I also coded for these three independent, additional independent variables. And then let's look at question three. So what I did there is I used all of these code mixing classes from question two. In addition, I added some more lyrical code mixing uh, categories that were adapted actually from that, that one study that Dr. Piconi mentioned from Sweden because she did lyrical code mixing in her dissertation. So these additional, code, these additional categories were intersentential code switching within a verse, intersentential code switching between verses, and intersentential code switching between stanzas. So, and in addition, um, I did add nine other independent variables that I coded for to account for the three languages involved for question three, because we're dealing with the three languages. And also since the songs are considered in their entirety for this question. So um, my first iteration of this study was a pre-pilot study. So before even this one um, that I did in 2019, but I elaborated on my pre-pilot study and I did my first pilot study with my colleague, um, my colleague Kelly Luna, I don't know if she's on the call um, on the Zoom, but we did Hazel Luna 2019. And for this one, um, we started by looking at the code S pronunciation of the top three Puerto Rican artists which were Bad Bunny, Daddy Yankee, and Osuna. And these are all Guinness Book of World Records that they've gotten. So these are hugely, hugely famous popular artists. Um, so we, I was comparing when they sing versus when they speak as far as their coda as pronunciation. And I did find a statistically significant difference. They had more maintenance of coda in their song performances, but had more non-maintenance, so aspiration, or deletion in their spontaneous speech. So my second study, um, which was Hayes 2020, it, it paralleled my first study, but it focused on the newest region dominating popular Latin music, which you may have noticed is Colombia. So for this one, I looked at um, the pronunciation of top artists from Medellin, Colombia, which is J Balvin, Carol G, and Maluma, when they sing versus they speak. Again, I found a statistically significant difference. They had more maintenance of coda in their spontaneous speech, but they had more non-maintenance, aspiration or deletion in their song performances. So I said, hmm, something interesting is going on here. So my third pilot study, Hayes 2021, this is what led up to my dissertation. So this is a comparison of my first two pilot studies. So for this one, I compared the coda as pronunciation of the top three Puerto Rican artists, Bad Bunny, Osuna, and Daddy Yankee, with the top artists from Medellin, Colombia, uh, J Balvin, Carol G, and Maloma, when they sing versus when they speak. So again, I found a statistically significant difference, though there were opposite results. So both groups were holding to their regional variants when they're speaking, but they were both changing to a different pronunciation when they were singing. Hmm. So divergence in their speech, but convergence when they're singing. Fascinating. So let's look at some representative data, some of the stuff that I found that was interesting. And let me kind of share with you some of the cool stuff that I found. So here are a couple of screenshots using the software Pratt that I mentioned before to show you some of the S, the sibilant maintenance S sounds uh, by Bad Bunny, which is actually kind of rare when he's talking. So it was kind of cool to see it. Um, so this is, what it, this is what it actually looks like when you say things. So this is him saying the CS. You can see that it's all kind of darkened in. That's the CS, the has at the end, it is an is. And those of you guys that have heard Bad Bunny know that it's kind of rare to hear him say is. Um, and then here, here's some more from Si Veo Tu Mama. And he's saying quieres and las. So all of these, I'm like, oh, interesting. I'm taking a picture of that. Um, so now let's see what Bad Bunny's speech typically looks like. So typically he's going to have a lot of unmarked deletions with no space left where there would have been an S. Um, so here's some examples of this from the YouTube artist spotlight stories. 
Um, so you can see there are just like no S's there. For example, in the middle one, that just sounded like toda la opción, uh, where there's no S sounds. Or the last one, it just lo mano, and the S's are gone. Um, now, in instances where there were double S's, where like a, a word ends in an S and the next word started in an S, I noticed that his words were divided by a glottal pulse, the vertical lines. I don't know if you can see that, but there's lines going up and down. And that was exactly where the lines were divided, whether or not the S was deleted. So, for example, in the first one, it's tus sueños. He kept both S's there, and you can see the line division. In the second one, he just said, e eh, saber. So there, there was no, there was no S at the end, but there was an S for saber. And then in the third one, originales, C, both S's are there. So that was really fascinating what I found there with his. Um, so now changing gears to J Balvin, his pronunciation varied a bit. Um, and we can see that here in just this one line, he has an unmarked deletion where there's no space. Uh, there's a marked deletion where there was a space and there is a maintenance of S as a sibilant. So this one line here, let me show you guys with my little pointer. So here we have just su, and then here we have lagrima with a space, and then here we have the actual valoraste. So we have su lagrima, valoraste. So kind of a little bit of everything. Um, and then here's another line um, of another, this is from the song X, and here he has the S where he actually has the sibilant S, and then this S here is totally gone. It goes right into the next sound. And then this S here is totally gone. It goes right into the next sound. Um, so this sounds like estamos claro. So there's two unmarked deletions with no space back to back. Um, but let me show you a couple of screenshots of what, is, of what his speech typically looks like when he's just talking. This is from his interview in Rapiton talking to El Guru. Um, so here he's saying, here you can see that says, haces tus entrevistas, you can see all the S's there in here, los artistas, so all of his S's are typically there when he, when he speaks. Um, and then where he had double S's, I noticed that for him, it was more at the dip. The division was more at the dip in the intensity line, which is yellow here. Um, it kind of lines up with the, with the glottal lines, but with him, it, it was a little bit more accurate right at the dip. So here it's más simple is where that divided up. And here sus sencillos, but again, but he is keeping all of his S's there. Um, so moving on to question two, uh, here's some interesting code mixing findings from Bad Bunny songs. So notice here that the borrowings, like when a word is adapted a little bit, can you tell where the original word came from? Kind of cool. I color coded some of the adaptations. Uh, here we have hangiar. Frontear, um, bloquear, stackear, baquear, hackear. Um, the single word switches I, I left in italics, uh, like London, shots, um, and then the calc. So these are expressions that are used in a different language. In bajita, like low key, uh, un TBT, throwback Thursday. Um, let's see some of the stuff that I found in his interviews. And again, the single word switches are in italics. Um, like he said, underground mainstream when he said vintage, vintage super cute vintage and then fakey um and then for nouns notice that some of the some of them have it's a it's a borrowing but they have a spanish article uh like un feel un refresh un look and notice the initial the added initial e which is mandatory in spanish you can't start a word that's s, s with a consonant unless you have an e so it's a stylist a sneaker um and for calps again he used in bajita um, and let's look at some interesting things in J Balvin's songs. He uses several uh, switches, which are in italics, fly, hype, delete. Uh, so heva comes from heavy, uh, bloqueo. Uh, always has great calcs. Tumbar la peluca, must snatch your wig. Um, pretty cool. Um, and then from his interviews. So he, he uses a lot, of, a lot of code mixing in his interviews. Uh, but notice that a lot of it's in italics. Um, listen and un game changer, el challenge, el approach, el timing, el show, las coras, <laughs> cool, foreign. Um, it, the awesome calcs, though, like seriously, the awesome calcs. Um, salir de la zona de, de confort, están jugando safe, comprar manzanas con huevos, like compare apples and oranges, but literally comparing apples with eggs. Uh, los OG, original gangsters, la vieja escuela, old school, so cool stuff. 
I get excited as you can tell. Um, and then question three. So these are just a few of the interesting lyrical code mixing findings from just a couple of the songs, but I, I color coded these. So notice the interaction between French, Spanish, and English. Um, and just a, these few examples. This is from the song Jaja by Ayana Kimura and Maluma. So she says, baby to dead sa. So baby, you're killing it. And it's a mandame location, send me the location. Um, and then from Mamacita, Jay Russell, she's Filipina, she speaks English. Uh, Boy, you got me caliente hot when you call me Mamacita hottie. And then you got me saying, ooh la la, French. Uh, Ay Dios mío, oh my God. So the lyrics self translate right there. Uh, call me Mamacita. And one more song that I really like uh, for English. So he's, he's French of Congolese ancestry. Uh, he says, Mamacita, je suis long que uh, babe, I'm the man that you were missing. Pour toi, je fais du beef, du l'année. For you, I make money all year long. Baby, on va s'en uh, Baby, let's get out of here. So fresh, so clean. Andale. So, you know, come on. Uh, baby, on va s'en um, so aller. And then, bonita, oui, viens avec moi. Allez, viens. So pretty, yes, come with me. Come on, come. So notice how they're all interacting with each other. So now for the discussion, uh, so this is gonna be an analysis of how the results actually answer my research questions. So we're gonna put stuff together now. So question one, just to remind you, so this was, this was asking how do the two artists, uh, did the two artists sing the way they speak regarding the variable ways that S in syllable final position shows up? So here are the statistics for the artistic performance speech, so the singing. Um, but here's a breakdown for you. Uh, so for the singing, Bad Bunny has higher maintenance and aspiration and lower deletions than in his speech. Um, but fairly, fairly even numbers across the variants. Um, and Jay Balvin, if you look at this, he had about 50-50. It was pretty, pretty even there for maintenance and deletion. And here I put the deletions together just for, for simplicity's sake. Um, and here are the stats for the spontaneous speech, which is the interviews. But here is a breakdown for you. So for spontaneous speech, you can see that Bad Bunny overwhelmingly used deletions. I mean, wow, 92.75%. Whereas Bad Bunny overwhelmingly used maintenance. So now this here is very typical of the regional variants, very typical of the way an island Puerto Rican speaks and very typical of the way somebody from Medellin, Colombia would speak, which ties into 1A which is asking, you know, are they singing the way they speak or are they shifting to a different pronunciation? So we just saw these little highlighted areas. And like I said, they are speaking the way they speak in their, based on the regional variety. But you see that there is a difference going on here. So there is a clear difference here for Jay Baldwin, but we're gonna consider another factor uh, for Bad Bunny. And of course I had a whole bunch of other stuff in my actual dissertation, uh, but let's look at Erker's 2012 study. He said that Puerto Ricans typically have the shortest code S durations in milliseconds when they're, when they're speaking. Um, and here I have them, the shortest is gonna be the lowest category number. So for Bad Bunny, he does have the shortest category, the, the lowest category number, the shortest duration when he's speaking but not when he's singing. So hmm, with this added information, they are shifting in their APS. So question 1B, is the difference statistically significant? So this is when it really matters. And my answer is absolutely yes. So here are just some of the statistically significant relationships that were found. And notice that the lower the p-value, the more statistically significant the finding is. Um, most relevant to my study is this first set of relationships, the realization of coda S. So, you know, was it maintenance? Was it, you know, was it aspiration? Was it deletion? Artist, whether it was Bad Bunny or J Balvin, and performance mode, whether it was spoken or sung. So this relationship was statistically significant, very, very low number. Um, and from there, I drilled down to find specifically where the significances were. And the relationships were significant by individual artists as well. As you can see here, Bad Bunny and J Balvin also had very, very low p-values. Um, and from there, I also found some more relevance here for aspiration, uh, for marked deletion, and for unmarked deletion, here it was approaching. So 1C, what motivations might cause a difference? in the pronunciation when they sing versus when they speak. So it could be the creation of a new pan Latinx identity that goes beyond internal divisions within Latino culture. So this unifying factor has long been a part of reggaeton. It could be that there is dialect leveling where the variants are being bridged in pop music. Um, 
It could be how easy it is to get online and to watch others. And slang and pronunciations are diffusing more quickly across the Spanish speaking world and coalescing into their own thing. It could be locality where pronunciation can connect certain identities and set other groups apart. But I have a competing theory. It could very well be that this new Caribbean leaning pronunciation is becoming the model for the pronunciation in all Latin pop. Much like Trudgill said that American leaning pronunciation became the model for pronunciation in British pop. And lending weight to this premise is the 2017 song that all of us have heard and we can all probably sing along to, Despacito by the Puerto Ricans Luis Fonsi and Daddy Yankee, which was a global hit before uh, Justin Bieber even jumped on the remix. Um, and this song was number one in the US. It dominated the charts for well over a year. Um, and this theory can also claim some support by listening to other artists like the one that I mentioned, uh, Becky G of Mexican Ancestry, who's singing with markedly indexical Caribbean phonology. So let's take a question two. So uh, do the artists sing the way they speak with regard to their English, the Spanish English code mixing practices? So here are the statistics for the artistic performance speech for the singing. But here's a nice little breakdown for you. For Bad Bunny, he had less single word switches and tag switches than in his speech, but more single word borrowings, intersentential switches and calcs. So that was higher. Um, now Jay Balvin had a little less word switches, but more tag switches than in his speech. Um, here are the stats for the spontaneous speech, which were his interviews. But here's a nice little breakdown for you. Um, we can see that for Bad Bunny, his single word switches um, and his tag switches were much higher when he was just talking. And his last two categories were almost non-existent. For Dave Balvin, his single word switches were higher and his calcs were much higher. Tags were lower, but the other categories are pretty comparable. Uh, question 2A, is the difference statistically significant, which is really what matters? Absolutely, yes. Um, and here are just some of the statistically significant relationships I found when I ran a linear regression. Um, notice again, the lower the p-value, the more significant the finding is. So I used code mix class as a dependent variable. And remember that these are like single word switches, intersentential switches, tag switches, all of that. Um, so the relationship between the code mix class, whichever category, the artist, either Bad Bunny or J Balvin, and the performance mode. So this was statistically significant. Um, and again, drilling down when I specified Bad Bunny um, in code mix class and performance mode, that was also significant. And for Jay Bobbin, it was approaching significance. There it is. And question 2B, um, what motivations might cause a difference in their code mixing practices when they sing versus when they speak? So let's consider each separately because each one's really their own case. So for Bad Bunny, so he is an island Puerto Rican who seemingly overnight went from college kid bagger from a modest semi-rural town to global star. He just started learning English, but his code mixing practices align with Perez Casas 2008 documentation of island Puerto Rican code mixing. He might be adding more code mixing to his songs just to connect with his fan base or as his English improves. And he recently code mixed with Japanese on the song Yonaguni in 2021. Pretty cool stuff. Um, so now Jay Balvin, on the other hand, he came to the US from Colombia as a teenager, as an exchange student. He, he went to Oklahoma and then he went back to Colombia. Then he returned to the US a few years later to work. Then he went back to Colombia to go to college to start his career. So he know he's fluent in English, he knows the American culture, but he's adamant about his Spanish speaking Colombian identity. He does use English tags in his songs like let go and the businessman. Um, and his, his artistic code mixing is done stylistically. So research question three, is the lyrical code mixing of the two artists identifiably similar or different than that of other top Spanish, English, French artists who also lyrically code mix. So here we found parallel percentages. So they had similar code mixing practices. So for intersentential switches that occur um, in type five intersententially between verses, they had pretty comparable percentages across the board, as you can see here. Uh, for single word switches that occur in type four intersententially within a verse, also pretty comparable. Um, and here for intersentential inter switches that occur intersentential between stanzas, Bad Bunny had zero, but Jay Balvin and supplemental artists, you know, 
pretty comparable. Now, calcs for the rarest because those are the expressions that are in the different language. Those, those are the hardest to pull off. So those are the rarest. Now, I also did find a statistically significant relationship at P is less than 0 0.001 between the lyrical code mixing type which were these, these three, uh, the code mix class, which were all of these, and 25 of the artists to include Bad Bunny and J Balvin. So there's definitely something going on there. There was no significance for 15 of the artists, and I think it's only because they didn't really have as much data, um, but there is actually more there that I do want to dig into in the future. Um, question 3A, what motivations can be posited to explain this new trend? So let's look at this. So artists are incorporating different code mix classes and types, either pulling in new words, uh, switching language after a line or stanza, or switching language with an artist that speaks a different language. That's something that Dua Lipa did uh, when she sang, she sang Un Dia One Day with Bad Bunny and J Balvin, but she only sang in English. So that's another, another way they can do this. A new trend that more artists are doing is they're singing in languages that are not typically their own. They're overcoming boundaries, trying different musical styles. Um, a recent example that we're gonna hear a little snippet of here in a second is uh, one of the two new Ed Sheeran J Balvin collabs, which is called Sigue, where they both sing in Spanish and English. And Ed sings, oh my gosh, the cutest thing. He says, tu blanquito peli rojo, rojo. So your redheaded little white guy, just the cutest thing. So we're gonna hear that in a second. Um, so conclusions. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys a summary, talk about some of the difficulties, difficulties I encountered uh, and how I address them and directions for future research. So uh, to conclude here, um, in this study that considered the artistic performance of identity via code S and code mixing by Bad Bunny and J Balvin, here again are the questions and the answers. Uh, so for question one, do the artists sing the way they speak regarding the variable phonetic realization of S in the syllable final position? No, they do not sing the way they speak regarding code S. So remember that we saw that Bad Bunny used a statistically significant amount of maintenance and aspiration in his singing, and he overwhelmingly used deletions in his speech, which is typical of an island Puerto Rican. J Balvin used about 50-50 maintenance and deletions in his singing, but primarily used maintenance in his speech, which is typical of Medellin, Colombia. So in their singing, they are both shifting to a different pronunciation. Question two, do the artists sing the way they speak regarding Spanish-English code mixing practices? No, they do not sing the way they speak regarding their code mixing practices. Um, so remember that there was a statistically significant relationship between the artist the code mix class and the performance mode. And they also had different motivations for, uh, for the difference in the code mixing and for completely different reasons. So we talked about that. And then question three, is the lyrical code mixing of the two artists identifiably similar or contrastive to that of other top Spanish, English, French artists who also engage in lyrical code mixing? So it is similar. Um, and there are definite parallels in their code mixing practices, but there was a statistically significant relationship found between the lyrical code mixing type, the code mix class, and the artist J Balvin, Bad Bunny, and 23 of the artists. And like I said, 15 of the artists did not have a statistically significant relationship. And I think there's still a lot more I can dig into as far as that question, uh, because this is what's happening more and more and more. So uh, definitely that kind of left, that was a cliffhanger for me that I do want to dig into a little bit more. Some difficulties um, encountered and addressed. So this study was truly a passion project for me. Uh, so any limitations I encountered, they were surmountable, no big deal. Uh, but some issues that I did that I did run into were a lack of clear audio. People saying, "Oh my gosh, bad body! Oh my gosh!" I mean, there was a bunch of a bunch of screaming audience, uh, Latinos talking over each other. Um, so all of that, um, there was also a lack of interview transcriptions, um, needing proofing, um, and inaccurate song lyrics. So, um, but what I did was I was able to, let me see, where am I? So I addressed these by, I slowed down the playback speed on YouTube, um, as well as I used, I, I used Pratt software to annotate the audio on the Pratt text grids. I also used Word files to further annotate uh, the transcriptions and the lyrics before coding everything in Excel. So now the other difficulty I had um, was having over half a million cells of data and not enough of a statistical background to handle it without a refresher um, and support. So luckily, 
I was able to uh, address this issue by consulting with a statistician on campus, Dr. Jane Daquin, thank goodness, um, and also getting help from my math and computer science teacher husband, my, my beloved husband, Justin Hayes, and also from Dr. Paul Reed on my committee who graciously looked things over for me and gave me a thumbs up, <laughs> made sure I was on the right track. Um, direction for future research. So with the enormous amount of data I collected, there are so many fascinating ideas. I just put a pin in for future research. Um, some of the things I do want to get into are neutralization of liquids like R and L in songs versus speech. For example, in the song Calma when Farruko says, Por qué pa vacilar, no hay que salir de Puerto Rico, where in my variant I will say vacilar, and salir with the R sound. So that's something I want to I want to see our artists only doing it in APS. Um, what's going on there? Uh, deletion of intervocalic D in songs versus speech, but also um, that also extends to um, the deletion of the last segment of words in songs versus speech. And whether it's also occurring in social media by speakers whose regional variety does not typically delete that sound. Um, some examples here are the song title Callaita versus Callavita, I would say. And in the in the text, in the tweet here, to versus todos or na versus nada. And I'm extremely interested in researching the pronunciation of artists who are not typically speakers of a language, such as um, such as Spanish, yet are singing in Spanish, um, as well as uh, like the Becky G. Rosalia. Some examples here are DJ Khaled. Um, the song Borrachos with Sech, um, another Ed Sheeran song that's out right now, uh, Bam Bam with Camila Cabello. Both of these are currently top of the charts. Um, and as further evidence that lyrical code mixing is here to stay, I got two songs. I don't think I have time to play them, but definitely look them up. They're at the very tops of the charts as of today. Um, J Balvin and Ed Sheeran sigue. I've got, let me just give you one snippet because it's the cutest thing to hear him say this. Did you guys, can you hear that? Did you hear him say? The blanquito pelirrojo, it's the cutest thing. <laughs> and then this song right now is, this is a remake of um, Elvis Crespo. Um, and it is um, suavemente, but it is, it is a French Spanish code mixing with a little bit of a rye kind of flavor to it. Um, so, and this is number one on YouTube in the Francophone world. So a little bit of that, definitely look that one up again. And I cannot leave you without giving you at least a snippet of Bad Bunny and J Balvin. This is them under concert um, in Puerto Rico, very recently, December, 2021. And this is, they got together Bad Bunny's concert for the AM, the IMA remix. So we'll just give you a couple seconds of this. There they are. <laughs> so, um, and that is all I have for you guys. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Elizabeth Naranjo Hayes. My email is enhayes at ua.edu. My website, I have everything there enhaze.people.ua.edu. And I will leave you with my favorite quote by Bad Bunny. Estudiosa puesta paseo doctora. Um, and that's it. Here are my references. And that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, that was a uh, very, very rich. Uh, information uh, rich uh, presentation, almost at times trying to get a drink from a fire hose maybe, uh, <laughs> but, we, but uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it immensely. And obviously you're very enthusiastic about this project and, and so am I, uh, and you've taken it a good distance here. And so my congratulations. I also wanna thank everyone who uh, has, been has been watching and listening to this performance. And again, we hope that you some of you at least have left some chat comments or questions. And if so, uh, with an email address so that we can, uh, so Elizabeth can get back to you or to, to um, continue the interaction. And so um, with that now, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and hit my, make sure my save file is, is, uh, is let's see.
Did you, Aaron, have you activated yours so we know we have a copy? I will do that right now. Go ahead and do that right now. Save chat. Chat save. Mine says, okay, I just did it. I think it says chat saved, so it should appear on my screen someplace later on. Um, so that's great. So thank you again, everyone. And now this committee is going to have to leave everyone. And so we're going to end this session. Now the webinar is officially ending at this point. And then all the members of the committee and Elizabeth and those other individuals who have a vested interest in this and have, uh, have been cleared to be part of it are going to gather in a matter of minutes here for the questions and answers. Perhaps we would like uh, just a five minute break, Cl committee members, would you like, like a five minute break? To, to, so, so it's uh, so it's four, almost 4.40, let's say at 4.45, we will be getting back together for the, uh, for the question and answers among committee members, all right? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Elizabeth. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Okay, I can end.